Hi, everyone. We'll be starting in just a moment. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Health Insurance Updates and Open Enrollment for 2021. The presentation is intended to give general information and is not intended as legal advice. This webinar also does not establish an attorney-client relationship, although I am an attorney. There will be time for Q&A after the presentation. I also welcome questions during the presentation. If they would be beneficial for the group, you can try to type them in in the chat. One last thing I also want to say that I hope to be able to answer your questions, but there may be instances I might have to tell you I don't know it, either because it's not information I have offhand or it might be too specific for today. However, I encourage you to fill out an intake with us so we can properly research the information. So just figured to kick this off and explain a little bit about the CLRC. The CLRC stands for the Cancer Legal Resource Center. We are a program of the Disability Rights Legal Center. The CLRC provides information and resources to people affected by cancer, including patients, survivors, caregivers, and healthcare professionals. Our resources are free, regardless of income. People often ask, what does cancer have to do with the law? This is a list of some cancer-related legal issues. Cancer affects the patient, survivor, families, healthcare professionals, and impacts many different areas of the law. If someone has a legal question and is affected by cancer, whether or not the topic is listed here, they can contact the CLRC for more information. If you would like to view our resources on any number of topics related to cancer, please visit our website. Educational webinars like this one are recorded, so we can later put them on our YouTube channel for you to share with anyone who may want to learn more about a variety of subjects. If you have questions about today's presentation, please type them in the chat box. I will be leaving time at the end to answer some questions. That part of the presentation will not be recorded. However, if you have questions about your specific situation or someone you know has a question you want to ask about, please fill out our online intake form at clrcintake.org, as you can see on your screen. After you do so, you, we can research laws and resources for you and provide you with free customized resources. Everything is confidential. With the generous support of the American Cancer Society and Breakaway from Cancer, the CLRC has a revised version of the Patient Legal Handbook. The handbook provides an introduction to the most common legal issues that a patient diagnosed with cancer is likely to face. It's available for download for free online in English or Spanish by going to our website, www.theclrc.org. Providers can request copies shipped to their offices. This webinar will give an overview of insurance basics, current insurance options, consumer protections, and ways to minimize or change coverage, whether you're shopping on or off the health insurance marketplace. And just before I get started, I did this presentation last year and no one had any idea that we'd be facing a pandemic this year. So I recognize that the issue of health insurance and health is especially important this year. So hopefully within this hour, we're gonna cover a lot of ground and hopefully this will be helpful for you or someone that you care about. So let's kick this off. Part one, insurance basics. I wanna quickly through, go through some of these 
insurance basics with you. That way, if you are looking to purchase new insurance, you're familiar with the terms you'll be seeing. I know some of this is going to be straightforward and that a lot of you are quite knowledgeable when it comes to your health insurance. However, I just wanna make sure everyone is on the same page. The first thing to remember is that it is the patient's responsibility to understand their coverage and limitations. Saying, I don't know that wasn't covered, doesn't work as a way to get out of a medical bill. Even when we call our insurance company, there's a recording that says, verification of benefits is not a guarantee of coverage or something to that effect. We can't even always rely on the physicians treating us to know what's covered by our insurance plans and what isn't or to what extent. Even if your provider's office says they will call the insurance company to find out or tells you something is covered, it's always a good idea to become familiar with your plan so you can understand co-pays, deductibles, and networks. This helps prevent unforeseen costs. So in part one, we're going to go over this, some of the basic information everyone should know and understand about insurance. Knowing your insurance company, for example, and knowing that it's Blue Shield is not enough. If you call a doctor's office to make an initial appointment, they'll ask whether it's private insurance. This is because Blue Shield is also a Medicare and Medicaid provider in some states. Not all doctors accept all insurance plans. Private insurance is one you buy as an individual or family or get through your employer. Medicaid is insurance for people who are low income and meet other requirements. If you receive supplemental security income known as SSI, you should be eligible for Medicaid. Medicare is insurance for people who have been receiving Social Security Disability Income or SSDI for two years or are age 65 years old or older. Private insurance as well as Medicare Advantage or Medicaid plans can all be called managed care plans such as HMOs, PPOs, and POS plans. HMO stands for Health Maintenance Organization. HMOs usually have limited choices for their members because members have to select doctors and hospitals from within a participating medical group. That is why they are typically less expensive than a PPO. There are generally four types of HMOs. The first one I'm gonna talk about is a staff model. In this model, the physicians and other providers are employees of the HMO and work in facilities owned by HMO. An example is Kaiser Permanente. The group model, in this model, the HMO contracts with physician practices to exclusively provide services to patients in the HMO for a fixed rate. Open panel model. In this model, the HMO contracts with an independent practice association, IPA, to provide services, but these practices may also see patients who did not belong to the HMO. Aetna and Blue Cross HMOs generally follow this model. Network model. This model is generally a combination of the group model and the open panel model, where the HMO contracts with both groups, which are exclusive to the HMO, as well as independent physicians and IPAs. The other types of private insurance are PPO, stands for Preferred Provider Organization. Here, the network of providers is is less limited than HMOs and the physicians are reimbursed at higher rates for services provided. However, PPOs are generally more expensive than HMOs. POS, that stands for point of service. These plans combine aspects of HMO and PPO plans where you have to get a primary care physician to make a specialist referrals like an HMO. Users usually have some freedom of choice in providers, even those providers who are out of network, such as with a PPO, but with greater out-of-pocket costs. EPO stands for Exclusive Provider Organi Organization Plan. As a member of an EPO, you can use the doctors and hospitals within the EPO network, but cannot go outside the network for care. 
there are no out of network benefits. Here are some other basic terms to understand. Copay is a fixed amount you pay for a covered health service. This is usually paid when you get the service. Most office visit or specialist visits have a fixed copay amount that you either pay in the office or build for later. It's a good idea to become familiar with your copays for different services. For example, your insurance policy might charge you $20 for office visits and $40 for specialists. Deductible. That's the amount you have to pay each year before your health insurance plan begins to pay. For example, if your deductible is $1,000, your plan's not going to pay anything until you paid $1,000 in covered services. So your first visit or visits up to $1,000 may all be out of pocket. Coinsurance. That's usually the amount people are often most surprised about. Most insurance, even the best insurance, doesn't cover 100% of the cost of the visit. People will usually have a coinsurance, which is your share of the cost of a covered healthcare service. It's usually calculated as a percentage. If you paid your copay, but you're billed a random amount like $8.93 for physical therapy, visit that costs $89.30, that's probably a 10% coinsurance. So once you meet your deductible, you might have coinsurance on top of your copay. Also, it's really important to know whether or not certain procedures or services require pre-authorization. You may have to get your doctor to resubmit uh, or to submit a prior authorization to your insurance company in order for a service to be paid. Getting something pre-authorized does not always mean that it will ultimately be covered, but not getting pre-authorization when you need it can create administrative challenges. Usually pre-authorization is required for expensive procedures like MRIs. It's also important to understand your limits. I'll use physical therapy as an example. Some plans limit you up to 20 physical therapy visits per year while other plans allow you an unlimited number of visits. But you have to see your doctor every month for a, let's just say, prescription, so you understand your plan's rules about services that you need. Okay, we have to understand our coverage and read our policies, but where do we find this information? Your evidence of coverage or summary plan description can usually be found on your plan's website. If you have coverage through an employer, you can contact your human resources department to get a copy of the contract if you don't have it. The terms of the policy is the first place to look in determining what's covered. There are many federal and state health insurance regulations regarding services that health plans must provide that would supersede those provided for in an insurance contract. This means that there are protections that exist as your rights, whether laid out in the plan or not. An example is coverage for a pre-existing condition and annual screenings without needing to pay a copay or deductible. Often, all of this information is available online through your health insurance company's website. You can also call your insurance company to request a hard copy of your plan's documents. If possible, it's best to access this information prior to a time when you as a patient or someone else is in need of urgent care so that you at least know where and how to access it should an urgent medical question arise. Just like with your overall insurance plan, it's a good idea to become familiar with your prescription drug benefits. Now, I'm a lawyer and you shouldn't have to have a law degree to understand the language that's in your policy, but I know it a lot of times can be very intimidating. So hopefully this information will break down at least some of the terminology and help you as a guide through this process. Medications must first be approved by the Food and Drug Administration. You might know of it as the FDA. Until a drug is improved, approved, it could not legally be given to anyone except through an approved clinical trial or a manufacturer's compassionate use program approved by the FDA. Each plan has a formulary or a list of approved medications. 
Formulary medications can usually be prescribed without a pre-authorization. Drugs on a formulary are typically grouped into tiers. The tier that your medication is in determines your portion of the drug cost. A typical drug benefit includes three to four, three or four tiers. So tier one usually includes generic medications. Tier two usually in, includes preferred brand name medications. Tier three usually includes non-preferred brand name medications. And tier four usually includes specialty and biosimilar medications. Three tier programs do not have a unique tier for specialty medications. So the insurance company, not your physician, decides what is on the formulary. If your provider prescribes a non-formulary medication, check to see if there's a formulary equivalent. If not, talk with your healthcare provider about requesting special formulary coverage from your insurance company. Some insurance companies require step therapy. This is the practice of beginning drug therapy for a medical condition with the most cost-effective and safest drug and progressing to other more costly or risky therapy only if necessary. It's important to work with your doctor on appeals to discuss why the prescribed medication provides the patient with the best possible outcome. So compassionate use programs, I referred to it a moment ago, allow a manufacturer to give certain individuals a medication that's being tested in clinical trials before the FDA has made a decision about approving or not approving the drug. The, when the FDA approves a drug, it's approved for certain conditions or indications, as you often see on the label. Regardless of what the label says, a physician can legally prescribe an FDA-approved drug for any reason. This is cry, called prescribing the drug off-label. Note that your insurance company may not approve this coverage. Finally, if an insurance company is repeatedly issuing outrageous refusals to provide medication, some desperate patients have taken to social media, including Twitter, Facebook, and other platforms, and enlisted their friends to publicly demand coverage, and that can have effective results. Patients um, like yourself or someone you care about can check with their insurance companies to see if they offer a case manager. Case managers can be your go-to person for information about your plan, and often the case manager could go through appeals or advocate on your behalf to gain coverage or reduce costs. If your plan does not offer case managers or patient navigators, ask to speak with the same person each time you call a certain department if possible. Then write down their last name or employee number and extension. It is helpful to keep one contact for each department and make friends with them because some positive rapport can go a long way towards saving a lot of money if they spend time finding ways to reduce your costs. You can also avoid having to re-explain your entire story each time you call. Keeping track of who your contact is will assist with keeping accurate records, including careful notes of each phone call date and time, names of contacts, information covered, authorization numbers, any written communication, copies of bills, explanation of benefits, check stubs, etc. These are all very helpful for appeals. Maintaining an accurate journal or a binder of notes will lend credibility to you if there's a discrepancy. While this is a lot of work, I get that. Filing systems are helpful to assist with keeping track and it may be helpful to use a notebook to contain information. In experience in speaking with patients through the telephone assistance line, for those that keep accurate notes on or around the time that they had that conversation is a lot more helpful than trying to go back and remember a conversation from even a week or two before. So pre-authorization or prior authorization is a decision by your health insurer that a healthcare service or prescription drug is medically necessary. Pre-authorization doesn't always mean it will be authorized. If you have to get prior authorization, ask them to send you a written copy of the prior authorization. This should go without saying, but open all your medical mail, even if it seems daunting. And that's whether it's an email or um, if you're getting a paper uh, thing in the mail. So if you're opening your mail and have taken the first step in understanding what you're up against, sometimes there's no way to appeal decisions if you've waited too long. Thus, it's important to check for mistakes early. Review all bills. Mistakes happen. A simple phone call sometimes helps. Review each charge. We have a handout on our website with some helpful information about medical billing. 
you have to play an active role in your healthcare delivery, including the billing payment. It's important not to be caught unaware of what your coverage is. If you read something that you don't understand, call customer service, take notes. Beyond just knowing what kind of plan you have and how much your deductible is, you might need to know what percentage of certain services are covered and who's in your network and whether they can reimburse for out-of-network coverage. If you don't have the energy to do this, see if a friend or family member that you trust would be willing to do this for you. Now that you know what kind of insurance you have and some of the basics about insurance generally and how to maximize coverage, let's talk a little bit about some of the rules about coverage as well as some of the options you have if you need to purchase new coverage. I want to clarify a few terms that refer to different types of private insurance. Group, purchased by an employer and offered to eligible employees of the company and their eligible dependents. The employer selects the plan or plans to offer to employees. The premium cost is normally split between the employer and the employee, and there's a minimum percentage rate the employer must contribute. Individual. You purchase individually for yourself and or your family on your own or through the insurance marketplace created by the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act is also known as Obamacare. These are often purchased with the guidance of an insurance agent to help navigate plan choices and premium costs. Insured is the more traditional way of providing employees with health coverage where employers buy a health plan from a company and the employer either pays a portion or the whole premium. This is a fully insured plan. Self-insured means an employer just opts to pay the employee's medical bills directly. This is more common in larger companies and often people don't know what their plan is. Self-insured because an employer may use an insurance company like Blue Shield as a third party administrator. Figuring out whether you have a self-insured plan is important when it comes to health insurance appeals. Grandfathered plans created and purchased before the Affordable Care Act on March 23rd, 2010. Don't have to follow the new rules. Check the date of when your plan was created. Some self-insured plans don't have to follow the Affordable Care Act because they were created before the Affordable Care Act was implemented. Those are called grandfathered plans. Under the Affordable Care Act, which passed in March 2010 and was fully implemented in 2014, a lot of changes took place. One of the most important is insurance plans that count as minimum essential coverage can no longer discriminate against anyone with a pre-existing condition or genetic predisposition, including cancer. The pre-existing condition rule is true, is true for health insurance, not to life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance. Some states still offer protections for people with pre-existing conditions who want to obtain those types of insurance, but this topic is out of the scope of this presentation. If you want more information about this, please contact the CLRC. For health insurance, you cannot be discriminated against because of a pre-existing condition. So for anyone with cancer or a positive genetic test for a predisposition to cancer, you can still buy COBRA marketplace insurance and get Medicaid regardless of your health history. Your age and where you live are the only crystal characteristics that can be used to set rates. This change is significant because before 2014, gender was a determining factor in establishing premium rates and women were typically being charged a higher rate than men. Now gender cannot be a determining factor in setting premium rates. Rating area is an area used for determining premium rates, usually by zip code. The premium rate is based on the average healthcare costs and physician hospital discounts in that area. So costs may be higher if you live in a metropolitan city versus a small town. In late December 2017, Cong Congress successfully passed the Tax, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, repealing the penalty for the individual mandate. The repeal of the penalty went into effect last year in 2019 you will still be required or mandated to have insurance because the mandate itself was not repealed. However, you will not have to pay a fee if you do not comply. Additionally, 
from tax year 2019 and onwards, you're not responsible for reporting to the IRS whether or not you had minimal acceptable health care coverage. You're still responsible for claiming any premium tax credits and for reporting any advance payments of the premium tax credit received. You are still responsible for having insurance for the 2018 tax filing season or risking a penalty of either $695 for an adult or 2.5% of the household income, whichever was higher. In more recent Affordable Care Act news, some folks may have heard about the December 2018 case from a district court in Texas. It ruled that the individual mandate, which is the ACA's minimum essential coverage provision, was unconstitutional and invalidated the remaining provisions of the ACA as inseverable and the current administration's decision not to defend the entire ACA. The individual mandate is that most people must maintain a minimum level of health insurance coverage and those who do not must pay a financial penalty. So where are we now with this? The case is scheduled for oral arguments before the United States Supreme Court on November 10th, 2020 one week after the presidential election. CLRC is paying close attention to what's happening, so feel free to check with us if you have questions about any future changes to the law and how it may impact you. But as a reminder, the ACA consumer protection still exists. Preventative services still have to be covered by insurance plans. Young adults stay on their plan through age 26. Health insurance plans cannot impose lifetime limits and cannot discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions. So if you're looking to purchase insurance through your state's marketplace or healthcare.gov, we're getting to a critically important time of the year. It's important to keep in mind that you can only purchase or change plans during open enrollment or if you're eligible for a special enrollment period. For healthcare.gov, open enrollment is from November 1st to December 15th. Some states have their own private online marketplace while other use health, others use healthcare.gov. When you enter your information on healthcare.gov, if your state has its own marketplace, you will be directed to that marketplace website. Something that's important to highlight is that open enrollment time is limited to six weeks and unfortunately this can reduce enrollment. States that run their own health insurance marketplaces can and do have the option to extend that period. So this slide has a lot of information, but I wanted to go through and because people can access this webinar from across the country, I wanted to give a little bit of the landscape. Another thing to keep in mind is that regardless of when your state's open enrollment period ends, if you want coverage for January 1st, you generally have to apply by December 15th. It's a good idea to check with your state's marketplace as soon as possible to confirm your state's deadline for applying for coverage. I'm gonna pause for a moment in case you'd like to read a little bit more information on this slide. Plans in the health insurance marketplace are generally ordered, organized by metal categories, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. These categories are based on how you and your plan split the cost of your health care. The quality of care is the same. For bronze plans, the insurance company pays 60% of cost, and you pay 40%. For platinum plans, the insurance company pays 90% of the cost, and you pay 10%. It may be tempting to buy the cheapest plan, the one with the lowest monthly cost, but some of those plans with lower premiums may end up costing you more in the long run. That's if they have higher deductibles or higher out-of-pocket costs. When you enter in your income in the website, you'll learn whether there are tax credits to help you lower the cost of your insurance premiums each month. This is especially important for those affected by cancer who may have more expensive medical costs. If you are below 400% of the federal poverty level, you may qualify for tax credits to lower the cost. However, there are many gaps that exist for making plans actually affordable for people, whether they receive tax credits or not. If you reside in a state with expanded Medicaid, you must earn at least 130% of the federal poverty level to qualify for tax credits. If you reside in a state without expanded Medicaid, you must earn at least 100% of the federal poverty level to qualify for tax credits. In addition to price, when you're shopping for plans, compare all the different insurance company plans. 
depending on where you live, there may be options, there are maybe many options or only a few in each category. If you would like your doctors and provide, if you'd like your doctors and providers, first check with those providers to see which marketplace plans they accept. You might want to choose your plan based on doctors in the network. An example is when our office had health health net, we had a slightly different network or doctors than when we do after we change plans and move to Blue Shield. So thinking about open enrollment um, and premium tax credits, tax credits are now available for people under age 65 who purchase coverage on their own in a health insurance exchange and are not covered through their employer, Medicare or Medicaid. Premium tax credits will be available to help people pay for health insurance that will cap premiums on a sliding scale from 2% to 10% of income. Tax credits are used when you enroll and are paid directly to the cost of your health plan to try to keep your cost down. You do not need to wait until, you're, until you file a tax return at the end of the year. Tax credits are only available through the exchanges. You must enroll in a health plan through your state's healthcare exchange or healthcare.gov if you want to use your tax credits. At the end of the year, the tax credits may be adjusted if your annual income is different than you anticipated. This means that you will want to notify your state's healthcare exchange or healthcare.gov if your income changes. It's always a good idea to look at your options off the exchange if you aren't eligible for financial assistance. For example, if you're on Medicare or if you earn more than 400% of the federal poverty line. Some plans might be less expensive. You can always go directly to the health insurance website or call a broker. The same plans might be available off the exchange and may even be less expensive. If you're curious what the process looks like to shop for an insurance policy, let's use covered Let's use Covered California as an example. There are questions they ask to determine your rates. The most challenging part of this can be entering your household income because you're supposed to anticipate what your income will be for next year. And this is especially speculative for some people during the COVID-19 pandemic when they're unsure about the future status of their jobs. This can be very tough if you're contemplating leaving your job or if you've been in and out of the workforce. There are also ways to search for doctors and facilities. However, although these systems have improved since year one, I strongly encourage you to call the doctor or hospital directly to confirm whether they accept marketplace insurance plans. Now, for some people, having their certain doctor might not be that important, but for those affected by cancer, they may be very, very, it, um, they may be very, very clued into which doctor is good for them and may especially want to stay with their doctor. Or they may be thinking about moving to a new doctor. So it's important if you're affected by cancer to really understand whether your doctor will be covered under your plan. Many facilities have decided not to accept marketplace plans due to lower reimbursement rates. So don't just assume that because your doctor accepts an employer-sponsored Blue Shield or Kaiser plan, they will also accept the Blue Shield through Covered California. Make sure you ask. It's a lot easier to do this extra research in advance than to have to deal with your doctor not being covered. This is especially true if you have surgeries or other follow-up appointments scheduled. The most important thing for you may be to stay with a, few, with a specific doctor. In that case, I would ask the doctor or facility first which plans they accept and then use that information to search for those plans either on or off that, the marketplace. So we talked about thinking about different plans, but this will definitely help narrow it down if you know that your doctor only accepts a certain number of plans and or a facility that you're going to may accept a certain number of plans. And also if you're looking um, to have surgery, then it's important that you know whether that surgeon is covered if that's not your oncologist. Here are very few examples of some plans that were available in the Los Angeles area. I know it's very small, but you can compare the prices of these bronze plans. There are generally more HMOs and EPOs on the marketplaces this year. 
For anyone with a complex chronic health condition, a PPO is probably going to provide more flexibility and will likely have a broader network of doctors, even if the premiums are higher. Here's an example of a silver blue shield plan that was available in the Los Angeles area. You'll initially see the monthly premium, deductible, primary care visits, etc. If you're on the actual web page, you can click compare or summary of benefits and coverage. That way you'll get to, a, to see a lot more information about the plan. You may be particularly interested to learn about the prescription drug benefits. So this is important to check the formulary of the plans you're looking at if there are specific prescriptions you need. So earlier in the presentation, we talked about prescription drug coverage. So for if you're affected by cancer, it's not only important for you to see is your doctor and or facility covered, if you're planning to have procedures or thinking that's even a possibility and you talk to your doctor about some physicians, surgeons that may be performing those surgeries and seeing if they're covered. Another important component is treatment and what prescription drug cover, what prescription drugs are covered under that plan. These are all some of the highest costs that, that you want your insurance plan to cover or at the at the minimum to understand what is covered so you can be empowered with that knowledge in advance. I want to flag that if you're eligible for Medicare or Medicaid, you will not be eligible to get tax credits or other cost savings if you purchase insurance through the insurance marketplace. So just to clarify some vocabulary, Medicare is for those 65 or older and enrollment begins within three months of your 65th birthday, or those under 65 who have been receiving SSDI for 24 months, or people that have end-stage renal disease. You still become eligible for Medicare at age 65, even if you have to wait until 66 or 67 to collect your Social Security retirement benefits. You do have to have worked long enough or have enough work credits to be eligible for free Part A Medicare. However, Medicare eligibility is not specifically tied to whether or not you are currently receiving retirement benefits. So traditional Medicaid is generally for those who meet categorical requirements, are aged, blind, or disabled, according to Social Security, and have limited resources. That means taking into account the things you own, cash on hand, but excluding the home you live in and the car you use. If your income is less than Medicaid limits for your family size, you will receive Medicaid at no cost. Medicare's open enrollment period begins on October 15th. That's really soon as of the date of this recording. You will be able to go to medicare.gov to make changes to various aspects of your coverage. You will be able to switch between original Medicare and Medicare Advantage, depending on what works best for you. Even if you're satisfied with your plan, it's a good idea to look at what options are out there. Also, plans change from year to year, and so can your health care needs. Medicare enrollment periods. Initial from three months before your 65th birthday until three months afterwards. Open once a year, currently between October 15th and December 7th, and that's what we're referring to on your screen when we say open enrollment. Special enrollment, if you have a health, if you have healthcare coverage through you or your spouse's job, after turning 65 in a company with 20, with 20 or more, or rather more than 20 employees, one is eligible for en enrollment until a specified period after coverage ends. Medicare Parts A, B. Eight months following the month, the employer or union group health plan coverage ends, or when the employment ends, whichever is first. For Medicare Part C and D, during the 63 days after the employer or union group health plan coverage ends, or when the employment ends, whichever is first. These are 2020 numbers that you're seeing on your screen. Your tax returns are used to calculate Medicare costs. 
it is based on your modified adjusted gross income. You see that on, you may be seeing that as M-A-G-I. Part A is free for many people. In other words, they have no premium. A person would only have to purchase Part A coverage if they're over 65 but have never paid into Social Security. This generally only applies to people who have no Social Security work history or insufficient work history, such as a stay-at-home parent. For people who pay a Part A premium, the 2020 Part A monthly premium is $458 a month if you paid Medicare taxes for less than 30 quarters, or $252 if you paid Medicare taxes for 30 to 39 quarters. The Part A Medicare inpatient deductible is $1,000. $364 in 2020. The average 2019 Part B premium was $144.60 a month or higher depending on income. There's also an annual deductible of $198 per year in 2020, which may apply to certain services. People with high incomes, which is considered as 87,000 individually, or 174,000 for married couples have higher Part B premium, while people with limited incomes may be eligible for a Medicare savings program to help with paying their, med their Part B premium. In a Part C plan, you generally must pay the Medicare Part B premium. Some Medicare Advantage plans may also charge you an additional premium. On average, Medicare Advantage premiums will decline while plan choices and new benefits increase. On average, Medicare Advantage premiums in 2020 are $25. Costs vary by plan, but the average monthly premium for Medicare Part D is $42.05 in 2020. People with high incomes have a higher Part D premium. The deductible varies by plan as well. For Part D, Medicare offers different levels of low-income subsidies called extra help which can be applied for by submitting an application to Social Security. These pay the cost of prescription drugs above and beyond a standard Part D prescription drug plan. To qualify, you need to receive Medicare and have low income and assets. To qualify in 2020 for extra help, a single person had to have $19,140 or less of annual income. Here are some resources. We highly recommend the Medicare Right Center and your state health insurance assistance program. For additional Medicare resources, you can contact our office through our online intake as well. Also, check the requirements and eligibility if your state has a health insurance premium payment program. I'm going to pause for a moment in case you want to jot something down immediately, but as I said at the beginning of this presentation, this presentation will be recorded, so you'll be able to pause on the screen on YouTube or if you watch it on some other platform and be able to write down the exact information. While our healthcare system was greatly reformed through the ACA, we still have a long way to go. There are still many people who fall through the cracks and cannot afford coverage. Many people with an undocumented immigration status or those who live in states that haven't expanded Medicaid need to find other ways to get medical treatment. If you can't get healthcare during any of the ways we've talked about, here are some options. Hill Burton is a congressional law which gave hospitals and other health facilities money for construction and modernization. In return, the facilities that received these funds agreed to provide a reasonable volume of service to persons unable to pay. While the program stopped providing funds in the late 1990s, certain healthcare facilities are still obligated to provide free or reduced cost care. You can call the national hotline to get a list of obligated facilities. There's a separate contact number for Maryland residents. And you see that number up on your screen with the word MD, that's for Maryland. Charity care. Many hospitals have free or low cost care available to low income patients. Speak with a social worker or the patient services department at your local hospital 
to determine which options may be available. Hospitals cannot charge uninsured individuals who qualify for financial assistance more than they, what they charge insured patients. The limitation on gross charges applies to all hospital care, not just emergency care. Private health insurance. Although this can be an expensive option, anyone can purchase private health coverage as long as they do so directly from an insurance company or through an insurance broker. Now we've gotten to part three. <clears throat> Sometimes a phone call can result in a lot of savings and other times a formal appeal needs to be made, but it starts with knowing your plan. Now that you know what kind of insurance you have and some of the basics about insurance generally and how to maximize that coverage, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the rules about coverage as well as some of the options you have if you need to purchase new coverage. Now that we've discussed marketplace insurance, Medicaid and Medicare, I'm going to briefly discuss COBRA and state COBRA. If you're employed or were recently employed, COBRA, which stands for Consolidated Omnibus Reconciliation Act, and after hearing that name, I'm sure you know why, why most people just refer to it as COBRA, allows you to continue on your employer insurance for a period of time, even after you are no longer an employee. COBRA is a federal law that provides for continuation of coverage. Under COBRA, a former employee keeps the same insurance if they lose their job or drop below the number of hours required to get insurance through their job. Or if they lose coverage, uh, if, if they lose coverage their spouse was providing by divorce, legal separation, or death, or they become entitled to Medicare. It's expensive, but it may be the best option for people currently undergoing treatment. A patient can continue the same insurance coverage for their employer without having to switch doctors. So if someone feels strongly that they need to see their specific doctor for as long as possible, even if the cost is higher, this could be a good option. One downside is that the purchaser will pay the full premium. That's the portion they were paying as an employee, plus the portion their employer was paying and an administrative fee totaling 102% of the monthly premium cost. An employee may qualify for COBRA if you work for an employer with 20 or more employees. The standard period of COBRA coverage is 18 months for leaving their job, but they could potentially be eligible for an extension under certain circumstances, such as someone becoming disabled according to Social Security or has a second qualifying event. Most people know about COBRA, but many people don't know that their states have laws similar to COBRA that apply to employers with fewer than 20 employees or that extend the time period for that a person may be eligible for continued coverage. And that's important to recognize. COBRA is a federal baseline, meaning it applies across the country, but your state may go farther than that in terms of protection. If you are under 65, you may notice that there are certain gaps in the insurance system. The first is that a person is only eligible for Medicare if they're under 65 and have been receiving SSDI for two years. Therefore, a person under 65 who becomes disabled has a minimum period of two years before they can access Medicare. After receiving SSDI, a person who was previously eligible for Medicaid due to low income may lose it due to the income they are receiving from SSDI. This creates a problem of figuring out how to get insurance while you wait for Medicare to kick in. Options include COBRA or purchasing insurance through the healthcare exchange. Some states provide assistance to making COBRA payments through programs such as health insurance premium payment programs, known as HIP. In addition to these gaps, while awaiting Medicare to kick in, plans that may be required through insurance companies to supplement Medicare, such as Medigap plans or Medicare Advantage plans, are currently allowed to hike up prices to people that are under 
65 because they believe that the cost for a person who is disabled may exceed the cost for an average person reaching age 65. We also have some helpful resources on our website, including a step-by-step -step guide to insurance appeals and a handout with information about accessing prescription drugs. Here are some related areas for accessing insurance-related resources. So I'm gonna pause for a moment because even though this presentation will be available, it is being recorded and you'll be able to jot down the websites and pause the screen. There may be some people listening to this presentation that need information today. So I wanna make sure that you can get that information and be able to look further once you're available to look at this information at your convenience. As you can see, the second bullet point on your screen, these fact sheets are from the Cancer Legal Resource Center, the CLRC.org. You'll be able to get access to that information. And if you need individual assistance, meaning that you'd like to contact us, you can go to CLRCintake.org. And the way that I like to think about it, if there's an issue that's keeping you awake at night, the good thing about a website is that you can access it anytime. You're not waking any of us up by writing to us at three in the morning. If there's an issue that you'd like to get answered, we will help you for free and it's all confidential. We now have reached the end of the presentation on health insurance options. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have general questions about today's presentation or need some clarification, I'll take time for questions. I won't lock off just yet, but I'll end the recording now to answer some questions if there are any. So thank you so much. Here's the contact information on your screen and I'm going to uh, stop recording.